All right, so welcome everyone to our first session of uh, this fourth day of Special Speciality. It is my great pleasure to be able to introduce this session, which is uh, a bit unconventional or, or different from the other ones that we had uh, this week. And I am particularly excited because it's the first time that we have an official scheduled time to talk about art and visualization and things that are not scientific in, in, uh, in initial motivation. Um, and it is a great opportunity for us to broadcast to the world that SEMF is, is about um, art as well. So uh, we, we believe there is uh, a very um, a clear parallel uh, between science and art and, and engineering and technology. Uh, in fact, I was recently in a, in a, in a seminar organized by uh, Max here present in the Zoom call where um, there was this theme of design as, as a vertebrating concept that, that goes through science, engineering, uh, art, and, and I felt it was a, a, very, a very nice way to put it, to, to, to put design as a, as a sort of vertebrating concept in, in all this. So um, today we're going to have several creators that are um, working in some uh, kind of visualization of, of many different types. And I hope to uh, I hope to share my enthusiasm for just being able to discuss these kinds of things in a scientific, in otherwise scientific conference, because I do believe there is uh, immense opportunity for cross pollination, and, and I'm sure that many of the scientists present here uh, uh, can relate to the feeling that when you are developing ideas, you're sort of jamming with with your own uh, accompaniment, so or, or with your colleagues' accompaniment. So it's very similar to artistic creation in in some sense. Obviously, you have strict rules and strict conventions, which is, after all, not so different from some strict rules and conventions in, in art and music and things like that. So uh, without further ado, I'll uh, take it over to Mandy, and uh, I think he's going to present some of the creator species that are not present here today, and then we can go to any other uh, people who want to present today. Yes, thank you. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I, in particular, wanted to uh, represent two artists that uh, could not be with us today, um, but they were the first to respond to me and uh, very excellent. Uh, so let me see if I could share my screen at the moment. Um, here we go. Share. So do you see this uh, screen here with uh, Jason's work? Okay, cool. So uh, Jason, uh, I uh, originally found him uh, via, I think, one of the uh, people here in the audience today, Prathyush, um, on Twitter. And uh, they've been really, really uh, cool posting uh, uh, lots of different art. But uh, I thought this particular piece uh, demonstrated a very, like, uh, somewhat non intuitive uh, concept that most people would uh, take for granted in geometry. So it's a visualization of an anti-twister mechanism. Uh, and as you can see here, the cube is rotating um, and there's links attached to each face of it. And you can see that even though this cube rotates, uh, as long as these links are bendable, none of them are getting uh, caught up with each other or uh, twisted in a way that's uh, in uh, logically impossible. So uh, I thought that was a really cool uh, visualization of theirs. And they have more of a, uh, they have uh, rotating 3D projections of uh, 40 polytopes, and you can see more at their uh, website. But uh, in particular, I think uh, one of their cooler pieces uh, is this YouTube video here, and I will just uh, play it. And you can see that this is a uh, like a a three D uh, volumetric uh, cube, and there is a scaling and twisting that's happening in this uh, in these stack of planes, and uh, there's nothing that's being knotted up um, or nothing that's being tangled. Yet this twisting could still occur. So I, I thought that was a really cool idea. Um, might inspire. Uh, or be inspired by a few uh, ideas in physics. Um, and we, we can talk about that more after, uh, once everybody um, gives their uh, little uh, talk. But uh, moving on, 
I'd like to go over another artist uh, that was very enthusiastic, uh, reaching uh, out to me, uh, responding back to, to me, reaching out to them. And again, this was uh, brought up by uh, one of the users here, Pathyush. Uh, his name is Hamish Todd. And he has some really neat uh, tools that uh, he's building out uh, using this geometric programming language and geometric algebra ideas. So in here, you see this uh, object. It's like uh, a sphere that's rotating, and there's a bunch of planes uh, within it. And this uh, visualization is supposed to help you intuitively, uh, or at least uh, maybe help visualize the entanglement of qubits for quantum circuits. So there's a long video that uh, explains uh, how this might occur. And I, I encourage you to watch it uh, on YouTube. He has a, a few of them where he's building out, explaining the building out of these tools. But uh, in particular, um, maybe this could help lend some intuition uh, that I was able to pull from the videos. I'm not, I'm not a, a quantum uh, uh, computing expert, but uh, what I what I got of it out of it was anytime you see uh, a pulling along an axis here, uh, that represents a Lorentz boost. And anytime uh, you have uh, the spinning around an axis, you have a rotation. So you can see like uh, this is all being pulled downwards now uh, at each iteration of this uh, loop. Uh, and that's uh, the Lorentz boost. Uh, so it helps uh, visualize quantum computing with uh, hyperbolic geometry. So I thought, I thought that was a cool idea. Um, and then I will stop sharing and we can go to our uh, next person, maybe Carlos. So. Yeah, I can, I can very briefly, I, I really don't want to take any time of the people who are live here, um, but let me quickly um, share here. So if we go to the gallery, there is this, um, so we reached out to uh, Code Parade uh, about um, his recent game, Hyperbolica. And I've been following this, the development of this video game for some time now, because uh, when I was doing my PhD, one of the things I did was review um, the different projects that were trying to um, interactively visualize different geometries and, and topologies and or topologies. And um, so there were, for example, there was a, a, a video game, um, a render engine more than a video game, uh, developed in uh, MIT, I believe, that um, in, sort of implemented Lorenz uh, transformations uh, and uh, sort of relativistic um, frame, frame transformations as part of the render engine itself. So it was actually very neat because you, you could walk around and, and if you collected items in the game, you could see how your view was get, getting distorted by, by relativistic effects. So, and it's meant to be physically accurate, it's as physically accurate as, as, as we could make uh, a 3D render. So in this vein, I was following Hyperbolica and it was very coincidental that right about the time when we announced a special speciality, um, Hyperbolica 1.0 came out. And so we reached out to, uh, to the developer um, and he replied very enthusiastically saying, oh, this is a great event that you're organizing but I'm way too busy sort of back crushing and making sure that I get all the feedback from the community. Um, so we just basically uh, feature uh, his work. Um, so just, I'll play the video briefly. So, so you see, so just before I play, this is um, um, a hyperbolic geometry or alternative geometries uh, render engine, and there is a game built into it. So it's meant to be a sort of an adventure, simple adventure video game where your environment is rendered, your environment is geometrically hyperbolic or spherical, some, some non-Euclidean geometries. And, and the render engine is based on the fact that all, all geometries look locally Euclidean, obviously. And so you can render it locally in a very familiar way, but globally you have all these non-Euclidean um, effects. So I'll just play the, the, the trailer and I think that, that, that will be my, my little uh, contribution. Oops. <laughs> Oh, 
Right, so as you can see, it, there, there's some interesting ideas. I mean, I think this is one of the best ways that you can get any intuition about these geometries other than, you know, doodling and, and making diagrams on a piece of paper. So it's a great tool uh, to complement otherwise abstract mathematics about hyperbolic geometry and non-Euclidean geometries. Okay, so we can move to the next person who wants to go. So who wants to go next, actually, because um, we have some flexibility there. Okay. Yes, Teja, please, go ahead. So I, I was just ma I made a co-host so you can you can now share. Can you see it? Um we we can't see if you're sharing yet. Right. Yeah, we can see now. Do you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so, as you can see, um, I'm a happy artist exhibiting at your fascinating conference. And, uh, yeah, it should be better. Thank you, Alvaro, for collecting all of my artworks and putting it uh, them to the website. I'm very honored. And uh, what I'm interested in was summarized by Dr. Ted Achacoso, who is uh, considered the smartest medical doctor in the world, and he's also a neuroscientist. And, um, he, I'm interested in fractal nature of the universe, as we all are, and here is one fractal image I created that shows some benevolent creatures that are inhabiting the world of fractals. And here's another one that is more uh, blooming one, let's say that. And I'm also interested in uh, tiling the plane with geometrical shapes. And uh, what we can see here is a representation of a penrose tiling. As you all know, we can tie the plane with, uh, um, with regular geometric shapes like, uh, like triangles and squares, but uh, scientists and artists um, are, uh, did quite some work in the previous centuries because they wanted to tie the plane with a uh, regular pentagon, which, is, uh, which was something that uh, Albert Dürer was uh, interested in, uh, and Johannes Kepler, and they both came with some solutions, but not with some perfect one. It would actually show some five-fold symmetry on the bigger scale and on a bigger plane. Uh, so 250 years uh, after Kepler, Sir Roger Penrose came with his famous Penrose ties, which we can see here now. Uh, that actually possess uh, golden mean proportions and five-fold symmetry and so on. So uh, if we take a look at this 
particular sem segment here. I was, maybe you are curious if we can see something inside of that, and which was what I was curious about too. And um, this is what I found actually. And you can see that uh, from that quasi cube, which is the title of this work, which is also um, no computer involved. But we can see uh, that we have uh, similar, actually identical uh, shapes on a smaller and smaller scale. And we can see interlaced pentagons and stars and uh, many other things um, which are, uh, which consider constituent Penrose dominance. And uh, symmetry in a broader sense of the word is what interested, interests me, like it's actually harmony, harmony of the whole or all the parts of the whole. I'm also interested in uh, how visual mind works and in optical illusions and various in interpretations uh, we can get. Um, Here's another presentation. Uh, we see the same panel styles from the time P3 and both mean relations. And we have angles from actually uh, pentagons. There's another one that is amusing for the mind. And another quasi cube. We see interlaced stars. Another one. And this one can be amusing for the mind also. And then now we came to the actual quasi crystals, which were considered as something impossible in this universe. And this is a collaboration of uh, mine with uh, Japanese scientists, uh, material science uh, expert Anton Tsai. And you can see here that we actually have uh, some 3D analogs of the panel styling. Uh, and this is actually very fascinating. Dr. Dan Schechtman actually discovered quasi crystals uh, in, back in uh, 1982. And it took him uh, two years before uh, the community, scientific community actually uh, acknowledged that because it was um, before uh, it was uh, they had to prove on exams that uh, five fold symmetry in crystals is, is not possible. But he found them. And uh, in 2011, he won a Nobel Prize for this discovery. And uh, here's another presentation. Of that. Uh, it's my collaboration with uh, Dr. Yanis Dedinshek and Dr. Paul Steinhardt and also Professor Tsai. And this one and this one will be sent to the moon for the eternal exhibition. Uh, and I would like to point you to my website where you can find Moon Art, which is uh, an amazing, outstanding project, a collaboration between artists and scientists and technologists and uh, everyone. And uh, you will see what an amazing project that is. It should be launched this year something, sometime. I'd just like to point you to three books that can be uh, very good for your mind. This is the Puzzle Universe by Ivan Moskovich, legendary inventor. And uh, some of my works are found in it. And these two books, Lumen Nature, also about mathematics and, uh, uh, and space and uh, all kinds of things. It's uh, just an amazing book by Dr. Matilda Mercury. And uh, very stimulating for your mind is also the mad book. And it's, you can see my obvious strips on the cover and uh, many of my works inside. So I'm interested in visual art and music, and uh, this is my YouTube channel where you can find some interesting stuff, uh, lots of 
can or otherwise stimulate in frequencies, uh, I suggest you to read the description in the video. So if you share, should uh, wear headphones and so on, because many of them contain brain, brain wave entertainment. And this is my website. And we conclude with my self-portrait and many thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was very fascinating to see. Let me go back to gallery mode. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Um, Micah, do you want to go next? Um, sure, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. OK, um, let's see here. Okay, hey, um, I'm Micah, and I'm just gonna, let's see, I won't be able to hear just because I don't want feedback, um, but um, I prepared a, a quick presentation, so wish me luck, um, this is my first run through, but um, yeah, um, I like to make art about flipping stuff inside out um, to try and glimpse the vastness of inner realms so, um, yeah, uh, let me explain. Well, first I'll say, who am I? I'm Micah, and um, I go by Microscopes on the various internet platforms. And I'm, um, I guess like I'm a creative web hacker. I do uh, like computer programming, especially on the web. I love the web. Um, I'm a musician. I've been uh, doing music for a long time and um, I'm really into music. And then also I'm an amateur math nerd, so I just love math. I like especially like chaos theory and um, I've been studying some algebra, geometric algebra, uh, graph theory. And someday I'd love to study category theory, but you know, one thing at a time. Um, so yeah, um, I, I'll say I did have a little bit of science background. Um, I took undergrad uh, physics and sociology and I got a math minor and um, uh, one, oh, also currently I'm finishing up a video game soundtrack and uh, music, so I'm doing like some programming for a video game. Um, yeah, but uh, a little story about my physics education, like I was supposed to be finishing, uh, um, I think I was in like my fifth year because I took too many classes and I was taking statistical mechanics for the second time because the first time I got an E plus. And um, the reason I went into physics in the first place is because I wanted to understand something deeper about the meaning of life. And I was going through statistical mechanics for the second time. And I wasn't finding the deeper meaning in like the Gibbs partition function and all of this. So I, I decided, all right, I'm gonna fail if I'm not careful. So I went to um, talk to my professor um, and I was like, what's going on? I want to understand the meaning of the Gibbs partition function and all this stuff. And, uh, and he told me something really helpful that, that was liberating for me. He just said, um, physics is just drawing cartoons of reality with math. And like from that moment on, I was free um, to just explore and kind of like uh, not worry about what the deeper meaning was too hard, but still think about it if I wanted to. So anyways, after school or after I graduated, I did get a passing grade. Um, I discovered this video that a lot of people may have seen called Mobius Transformations Revealed. And it was like a spark. Um, uh, and around the same time, uh, someone named Daniel Piker um, had some blog posts and some demos of uh, these horses that were flipped inside out. And I watched these videos I stared at them for, like, I just put them on repeat. And, oh, wait, you're not able to see my slides, are you? No. Um, sorry. OK, so here's that slide. And then, yes, this video, maybe some of you have seen this. Um, and then these, here's the, these are the horse videos from 2007 and 2008 of horses flipping inside out. Um, I watched these over and over again, and I, 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 I wondered, like, what happens when the horse eats and when it poops? Like, when the horse is inside out, I want to know what's going on here. Um, 
what did it mean? So there's that question again. I want to understand what's the deeper meaning here, and I, I was really excited about this stuff. Um, so I don't know how much I should play of this, but there's a really good Adventure Time um, <laughs> cartoon scene where where Finn flips inside out and discovers, you know, that he understands everything. That everything small is just a small version of of something big. And <laughs> it's it's a really funny scene, um, but uh, yeah. Over the next few years, I I, I kept studying this um, these these inside out horse things and uh, the Mobius transformations, um, uh, and learned about conformal transformations, and you know um, started to get into uh, geometric algebra a little bit, and um, and was thinking deeply about like what this all meant because there was something captivating there for me. Um, but Daniel Piker didn't put up any code <laughs> back then, and I wanted to do this, but there was no code. Um, so finally in 2012, I, I managed to figure out how to make the Mobius transformation for myself, and I made this, this um, little thing, which I'll show. Um, this is the Hyper Horse, and it's just like a 3JS thing with the Mobius transformation. And the cool thing about it is you can, it's animated and you can move it around and you can pause it and all this stuff. Um, so here's the horse running, uh, you know, inside out. <laughs> and, and of course I, I like to see like, okay, like if the horse eats, you know, um, the inside out horse is excreting like chewed up food. And then like when the horse takes a shit, like the inside out horse is, is, is like, eating shit or something. I don't know. It's weird. But like, yeah, it's uh, a kind of an interesting um, thing to look at. And I stared at this for a long time, too. Um, and there's some other things that I made at the time. Uh, you know, here's a here's just a little cube doing the conformal inversion. Um, and yeah, like this for a long time just sat there. Um, let's see. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I wanted to make more content, like, or, and I still do to this day. So, um, and I was pumped. So I, I, I managed to like compile Blender, which was really hard. I don't know how I did it. I tried doing it yesterday and I couldn't get to work. <laughs> but uh, uh, I made this, this modifier um, to do the, the Mobius transformation. Um, and so here's like a, a loop of a chain that's, you know, um, uh, inverted. So um, the whole thing is inside of one of the links, or one of the inside out links. Um, and here is a video uh, that I made from Blender. This is like a test shot of, of, of somebody sitting on the toilet on their phone. And, and then it, it, it inverts in a way so that the phone becomes the world. Um, I wanted to experiment with like the motion of the thumbs um, to, to make them seem like legs um, because I've been in the situation where I'm absorbed in the digital world and it almost feels like the phone is like taking over my whole life. Um, so that's that's like a test shot. Um, uh, the, I, actually, that's the first time I've shared this. Um, uh, oops. Okay. Wait, I'm confused. I'm not sure what's showing now. Oh, here. Okay, so here's a um, here's like a, a still from the from the, uh, the phone thing, and um, here's the shot that I really like, where it, it shows the fingers behind the phone, and they really remind me of like tree roots or something. Like they're just anchored in. Um, uh, and anyways, as you can see, like you can make some really weird pictures <laughs> with conformal transformations, um, and you might notice that. The world behind is like the code of the of the Mobius transformation. Anyways, so I've been facing some challenges in trying to like make content out of this stuff. And one thing is like level of detail is really hard because things go from being really small to really big like rapidly. And how do you make sense of all that? Um, another thing related to that is like tessellation. You know, um, doing, using conventional tools like everything is is mesh based and um, tessellation is really hard on like old school OpenGL. 
So how do you do tessellation dynamically? I don't know. Well, maybe I do, but okay. So um, and then control is really hard too, like and composition and just doing all the things you normally do in 3D become really hard because the errors blow up. You know, when you're trying to do these tiny little movements and all of a sudden everything's huge, it, mm. it's very hard to control. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about that. And then there's not really any standards um, uh, yet. Uh, the tooling is starting to come around, like people are doing lots of experiments, but yeah. Um, here's an example of like, this should be an infinite plane but it's like a funny looking polygon. And this is a familiar site. Like if you're doing any kind of like conformal inversion stuff, you're gonna see these polygons that, you know, they're not, they don't have enough detail. Um, so here's some possibilities um, for level of detail and tessellation. Um, maybe standard 3D meshes aren't always the right approach. Um, parametric surface representations and parametric volume representations is something I've been looking into recently. It seems promising. Um, and then this, there's all this like cool stuff with radiance fields um, that's coming out. And then, um, yeah, I've been messing with emulated dynamic tessellation, like using a, a pre-computed tessellation atlas and like swapping out little tessellation patches. Um, and then for control stuff, conformal geom geometric algebra is really good because you can use little primitives like circles and, and points and use them to construct like the sphere of inversion. Um, and then for the lack of tooling, we've got to make more tools. That's just the solution to that. Um, so some of the tools I've been working on um, uh, that people might be interested in checking out, um, Algeobraic is one that I just made docs for, and it's, uh, it's just a Python library for generating um, GLSL code that you can use, like shader code that you can um, use in a web project or to do some compute stuff. Um, I actually am proud to say I contributed Senpai's GLSL code printer. And that's like one of my proudest open source uh, accomplishments. Um, and then I'm working on something called quilting, which is like uh, uh, for doing um, conformally invariant Bezier surface patches. Um, and uh, this is a paper by um, Rimas Krasowskis and um, uh, and Severinus, right? <laughs> Wait, how do you say the name? Se uh, Severinus Zub. I, I apologize. Um, and then um, also for doing the tessellation stuff um, and instance rendering. So this is like a work in progress experiment. Um, I actually left, I lost my backpack with my laptop, so <laughs> I have to catch up on some of that stuff. Um, but then also uh, there's, a, I, I made a blender sphere reflection modifier um, uh, using geometric algebra. So I've been experimenting a little bit with using geometric algebra for control, and it seems promising. Um, so here are some dream possibilities. Um, uh, I'm curious about skinning armatures with, control, with conformal transformation, so like bones where some of the joints will be flipping inside out, and like you could flip part of the scene inside out. That would be cool. Um, I want to do stuff with volumetric scenes, hopefully someday. Um, and then also, I'm curious about like space-time transformations. Like, what do conformal transformations in space-time look like when you're warping animations? And like, how do you how do you slice through them? Um, and then also like, what can you do in higher dimensions? So um, this is a fractal that I made, slight detour, but I've been using some of the learnings from the um, conformal geometry to be able to render high dimensional fractals, like just using the stereographic projection. Um, and you can apply it as many times as you want to take like a, a very high dimensional set down to three dimensions. Um, and then here's some images from the quilting project. Like you can see the tessellation uh, on the right and you can see that the, the, um, the low poly model on the left is like, is very smooth. Um, uh, here's another shot showing like some of the triangles and how they're they're very smooth even though this is a low poly model um, when you do the conformal transformation like everything looks nice and smooth um, there's a zoom on the tessellation um, okay but um, getting back to what does it mean like I'm still thinking a lot about that so I just had some thoughts that I collected and questions um, that I'll share real quick um, 
one thing that I've learned during this during this time is that like the vastness of the cosmos is inside of everyone and every being and like if you unfold a, a little low locality in space like there's a whole world inside um, and that's really inspiring for me um, uh, our, our relationships with each other and with the natural world are like very intricate they're not only spanning like through space and time but also through scale um, I've learned that the world is both round and flat at the same time, which I think is very intriguing and kind of funny. Um, I've started to think of like, like the totality of being as being like a combination of self and other, um, and that if you, the, the interaction of self and other is like something, you know, that, that creates a whole. Um, and then a question like, are inside and outside a matter of perspective? You know, we seem to have a somewhat fixed perspective. Um, we're looking oriented outward, but I don't know. Um, what do relationships um, across different scales look like? Like, yeah, I'm curious about that. Um, and I'm definitely curious about what's the physical nature of our experience of scale. That's something I have very little idea of how to answer, but it's, it's a fascinating question to me. Um, so I'll end with a couple of Lynn Margulis quotes because I'm inspired by Lynn Margulis. Um, <laughs> she says, all I ask is that we compare human consciousness with spirochete ecology. That's not too much to ask, right? Um, she had a theory that, that uh, our consciousness is like a kind of descended from communities of spirochetes and their, their relationships with their ecology and with each other. Um, and then here is a, a, a quote from um, uh, an essay by Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan, who is her son. Um, and you can see that, I'll, I'll read the quote, topologically the self has no homuncular inner self but comes full circle, not based on the rectilinear frame of reference of a painting, mirror, house, or a book, and with neither inside nor outside but according to the single surface of a Mobius strip. Um, and you can see that they did this clever thing where, where the, um, the end and the beginning of the, um, of the essay are, are linked together through that sentence. I thought that was an inspiring um, quote to share. Um, so just a very quick special demo. And um, I'll just show I've been inspired this week. So I made like a little GLTF renderer um, uh, with the conformal transformation. Um, so here's another horse that I just found um, on uh, on the internet. Um, artists are down here credited, uh, Verena Bork. And here we can see some kind of old microscope um, being inverted. And then if I zoom out far enough, you can see that there's not enough polygons anyway there's work to do on that um here's a a triceratops walking um, with its feet kind of inverted upward um i find that to be really awesome and then here's some sort of a shiny fish um flopping around you can see how quickly just by the fish moving it it, it moves through the the sphere of inversion and flips. Uh, here's like a toad creature, but it's sitting on a leaf. And when you get, you get, you can see its toes there. They're really large. So I don't know. Maybe this is what it's like to be a bug. Um, and yeah, um, that's it for me. Um, you can find me on Twitter or GitHub. Um, I'm Mike Scopes, and I'm trying to make some cartoons a reality with math. So um, if you like this, you can also support me on GitHub sponsors. I just made my thing. I have to actually put it on there. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate being part of this, this conference and uh, just getting to meet everyone. And uh, it's been super inspiring. So yep. Well, there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Mike. I mean, that was very, very interesting, um, very uh, evocative, and uh, I think the right mixture of maths and philosophy and 
everything. It was it was very nice. Uh, and my geometric mind and my differential geometry background are very happy <laughs> right now. Um, Thank, thank you. you. Very interesting. Okay, so who should go next? I guess Patrick or uh, Chagosi. Next. Yes. Uh, me Please go ahead. Uh, ah, I need to wait. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I think you can. You can now. Uh, Uh, I don't seem to share the presentation. Uh, oh, geez. No worries. Does this work? Yes. Great. What if I present? Can you see? Excellent. Great. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, thank you for letting me go a little bit later. I haven't had my coffee just yet, so um, that was that was important. Um, so uh, thanks for coming um, to uh, this spatial spatiality uh, session, or um, as this AI-generated image would have it, Cyclone's spatiality. Um, uh, the uh, current models are, are not the best at reproducing text just yet, but um, uh, once you see how they work, you might agree it's it's amazing they um, even managed to get this far. Um, so um, I'm going to present um, just a little bit on um, the current uh, work that's going on on uh, making uh, AI-generated art or art in collaboration with um, AI models. Um, I'll just do a little bit of the background so you can see how it relates to different spaces and then uh, maybe present some of my own work that's in the gallery. Um, so the first thing to, to talk about is um, an image really is just data. Um, so, or a digital image at least is just data. You can think of it as pixels, but really what it is, it's a series of numbers um, and, and a completely uncompressed image. Uh, you can think about each individual pixel uh, um, being represented by a number in the case of a grayscale image or a list of three numbers in an RGB image. Um, and so you can think of the whole image as just a list of numbers. And you could represent that in, in several different ways. Um, as I said, an uncompressed image is just that raw list or a JPEG um, is a list of frequencies, which is um, some kind of transformation of the image um, so that the space um, it occupies um, fills up a physically smaller space um, in, in a data sense. Um, but you could also try to think about, um, well, what's the, what's the minimum amount of space that we can, can represent that image in? Um, so what a latent space does um, is, is you, uh, you take in a bunch of images um, that you want and you try to um, compress them so that, that the, the, the space that you're occupying is the smallest possible space. Um, so that you just have a list of parameters um, and each parameter represents hopefully one essential feature about the image so that when you, um, when you look at those parameters and retranslate them back into the image, you, you, um, you can get the same image out. And what that is, um, what almost magically what happens is that once you do that um, transformation into the into a latent space, what happens is that similar images or images with similar features occupy similar regions in that parameter space. Um, so you could explore that, that parameter space, take an image 
go to latent space, move a little bit um, within um, that um, within that latent space, and get out a different image that is close to um, the original image. It might have similar features. Um, so that's the way that um, that a lot of um, the recent work um, in uh, AI related to images has uh, been been happening. Um, but what happened um, about um, at the beginning of 2021 um, is that, uh, sorry about my discord um, there, um, is that um, OpenAI released um, a model which had um, both text and images represented within the same latent space. So what that meant uh, is that um, initially for clip, what it was used for was image captioning. So you could take an image um, and uh, translate it uh, and uh, get its position in the latent space and see and, and use that to see how close it was to a particular label, um, which can be used to caption images. But you can also reverse that. So they also released DALI, um, DALI 1, um, which was able to generate what was frankly incredible images at the time. Um, but they didn't release um, any uh, publicly available weights for that. People couldn't use that um, separately. So uh, um, quite quickly, um, a community built around, up around um, open source implementations um, of this. So um, the first one here, can you still see this? Uh, Yes, we can. Screen. Great. Um, so this is a notebook in um, Google Colab. Colab um, is essentially a Jupyter notebook. It allows you to run uh, Python code um, on the web um, with uh, free access to, to GPUs. So um, what that has meant is that, um, that people have been able to get access to compute um, and a variety of different notebooks doing different things have sprung up. So this this very first one um, by uh, Ryan Murdoch, um, Advad Noun, um, was able to uh, take an image generator, uh, which was undirected, and, and most undirected um, image generators tend to just produce dogs because a lot of the training set ends up being dogs. Um, but then you can can take this uh, this image, uh, change it a little bit, and then use that as a discriminator to check um, how close it is to the text input that you have. So you might be able to you can change it to uh, then represent images that you like. And very quickly, um, a lot of different methods were uh, developed to be able to. Uh, do different things about um, using this. Um, one of uh, the uh, main ones, um, early ones, uh, was uh, uh, by Kat Catherine Krausen, uh, um, who connected VQGAN uh, to this, and she also later uh, um, uh, pioneered another approach, um, which is clip guided diffusion. And so um, because of the availability of uh, Google Colab notebooks, um, which people can modify and do their own things with them, um, and this access to computing power, people, uh, there's been a community which has been able to generate like, really amazing things. So what I'm going to uh, do now, hopefully I haven't used up too much time on that uh, initial bit, I'll just, I'll just talk about some of my own images and some of the things that I've done. Um, so the VQGAN uh, plus clip model that I mentioned, um, I, about a year and a half ago, um, applied, um, applied a, an animation model to that. So uh, what you can do um, is if you take a single image that you generate and uh, warp it just a little bit and then re-input that image uh, um, as as a starting image, well, the quality is quite low here, um, but you can start to generate animations. And so I released a notebook that, um, that allowed you to move through 
um, these this virtual space um, with, through with different paths um, and therefore get animated images out. Um, and that was really cool. Then pretty quickly, um, uh, so you can you can what you can also do because you're because you are uh, inputting a text prompt at each stage. You can also uh, change that text prompt on each frame, or gradually change the weighting of the text prompts, and then you can get these these warping images. Uh, so this particular uh, one uh, goes through each of the nine spheres of heaven um, as the as the prompts and uh, it continually zooms in. So you get this kind of morphing, shifting effect, which is really beautiful. Um, one of the main, um, one of the main notebooks that's become really popular is uh, Disco Diffusion, which uh, took the uh, clip guide, guided diffusion approach, and it also added some three-dimensional warping. Um, so that's very, very, very uh, popular notebook right now if you want to start to get into making this kind of art yourself. Um, something that I'm uh, working on right now, I'll go uh, right to this one, is trying to uh, make uh, various different uh, endless loops. Uh, so for this, uh, just uh, for this conference gallery, um, I released this piece, uh, which is one of my best attempts so far at uh, making an endless loop work, uh, which I'm really pleased by. Um, hopefully the compression is not too bad, but each of these um, layers is a different generated image. And then um, at the edges of each of those images, I in-paint um, something so that I in-paint the edges so that they match up perfectly. Um, and that means that you can uh, endlessly scroll them like this, uh, which um, is something that I've been aiming at for a while. This also opens up the possibility um, of some spherical images um, or different uh, types of transformations that you might be able to do because um, you can move through the space um, in, in a different way. And so what Michael was just talking about um, I'm hoping to be able to start applying some of those spherical transformations um, to these kinds of images rather than uh, right now uh, the transformations that you do um, are either translations or zooming or you can apply a depth uh, model to them and get a 3D effect um, but transforming these images from obviously all the images in the training sets are two-dimensional images um, and so you don't get spherical images out necessarily, although you might be able to uh, prompt it, uh, to do some prompt engineering to get that. But what I'm hoping to be able to do uh, soon is apply some of these uh, spherical transformations. Um, I've been looking at the work of Henry Segerman um, on, uh, on spherical droste effects, um, and by heart also has been I mean, quite a while ago now, uh, was working on that. Um, so I'm really excited about where this is going. Um, I want to just, uh, if I have some time, do a quick shout out to some of the um, amazing people who've been developing in this community. Um, so uh, this can't possibly be a list of everyone because uh, the way that this has worked is uh, people release something and, and then remix it. Um, and also various different um, corporations have been involved as well, releasing uh, models you might have seen recently. Um, both uh, OpenAI has, AI has released DALI 2, which is producing amazing images, and Google has just, I think, yesterday or the day before released um, Imagen, um, which is their version. Also, uh, the images that they've released have been absolutely incredible. Um, and there's some work in the open source community to replicate some of that work. Um, but for some of the, the notebook and other uh, developers, uh, so Adverd Noun uh, obviously released the original Big Sleep notebook, 
uh, Catherine Krausen released uh, the VQ Gannon clip and also the clip guided diffusion work and is continuing to push everything forward. Um, the disco notebook that I mentioned was originally made by somebody called Somni and then it's been maintained by Gandamu. There's, um, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, and perhaps, uh, yeah, no, I, I in fact, I, I, I do want to keep uh, saying, uh, so uh, Zippy has uh, made a, a, a a much faster and smoother uh, version of some of these notebooks, as has DevDev. Um, I've been working with um, Nin uh, on potentially a, uh, a user interface for some of these that's outside of, of Colab. Um, and Multimodal Art has also been working on a UI uh, for that kind of thing. Human Art has uh, done a different approach. Uh, as has uh, Sports Racer and Dig. Um, all of these people do have real names, but um, this is how you will find them on Twitter or Discord or Reddit or any of the places that, that people have gone. If you want to know more about this kind of uh, thing, um, Multimodal Art has um, uh, is assembling um, lists of all of the, the latest updates, um, either new notebooks or new models or things weekly. Um, and as, as far as finding the art that people have done, um, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly, uh, talk about, um, all of the different amazing artists who've really latched onto this, uh, stuff. Um, but if you go on Twitter, you will be able to find them. Um, there's also, of course, um, been a lot of conversation about, well, is this art, um, how how to what extent can we call this art is the act of creating a text prompt art is the act of creating a new model art um and then interacting with the computer i see this all very much as you're collaborating with the computer um in order to create new art and a lot of the best things that people have been doing have, have been going back and forth between traditional uh traditional digital art, that's almost an oxymoron, and then and uh, going back and forth between the model and the artist and the model and the artist. Um, there's, of course, lots of video essays on this kind of thing. Lee Alexandre here has done um, really good exploration uh, on this. Um, and people have been make, making music videos as well. So one of the things that I released is an, um, an audio um, reactive tool uh, that allows you to create animations that that interact with with an audio track. Um, one of the the really beautiful music videos that I've seen has been by uh, Ben Levin, um, who is uh, in general creating some of the the best uh, music videos on 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 YouTube. Um, but I was really uh, excited to see that um, he used some of my code in um, in creating. Uh, a video for one of his EPs. That's all I have to talk about for now, but um, I'm happy to uh, continue to talk in Discord um, or wherever later. Thanks yes. so much for inviting me to uh, speak. Absolutely. I mean, uh, thank you very much for this overview. I, I very much enjoyed it. I think it's, it's a great opportunity to get peeks into these worlds. I'm, I'm very sorry that we are sort of uh, running out of time, but um, I think we should uh, go to Irida next. And uh, Patrius, if, if you want to present, let us know. Uh, we we are running short, unfortunately. Um, but because I mean, I, I want to spend an entire hour on all these uh, topics. And uh, but I hope that we get a chance to talk more during the during the breaks. And uh, I'll chase you down because these things are very interesting and very personally interested. So, Irida, please uh, go ahead. Sorry, I was looking for my cursor. Okay, now I found the cursor, now I need to do the play button. Can you see the screen? Oh, good. Yes, perfect, perfect, thank you. All right, well, thank you for sticking around for the last presentation. Um, I, I know we're over time. Unfortunately, I did plan all of the 10 minutes. So um, if you do want to Use them. Kate me early. Use them, hmm? use the 10 okay. minutes, yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. So I started the clock, 11 seconds in, okay, going. Um, all right, so we can discuss stuff later. If you've got questions, you can Google me, my name's there. You can find me under my name and so on. Okay, so my, my training is as a mathematician 
However, I have a feeling that my art will be the least mathematical and the least technically savvy from uh, the little bits that I have been able to catch from this um, from these presentations so far. Um, so I don't know, bear with me, this is something slightly different. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'd like to talk to you about um, visualizing spaces and using spaces for visualizing in three different directions. Um, so the first direction is this thing, you see a sample on the screen, which is at its simplest uses grids and colors to achieve a kind of 3D bass relief effect. The second one that will come afterwards is more about reading your emotions into already existing art, photos, sculptures, anything you've made using kind of simple geometric colorful shapes. And the third one, I don't think it has been touched upon in this conference, possibly because people would argue it's not really scientific. However, it's exploring storytelling and imagination as a space, but in a very pedestrian way, um, using randomized sets of keywords. All right, so let's get started. Um, what you see on the screen, that was something um, I was inspired to develop this kind of squares art style um, using the various studies of Paul Klee. So he's the Swiss born German artist from the first half of the 20th century. So if you look at his artworks, you see the 3D effect, you see the colors, the shadows, the shapes, but kind of they're not really explicit. I mean, that's not what he was going for. He was exploring. So my idea was, OK, I could make that a little more explicit. I could bring out the images a little more um, without going all the way to something like the auto stereograms, which require binocular vision, require you to kind of make an effort to see the 3D effect. Um, but also without losing the mystery element that you get from this kind of dispersion of color that at first glance gives you nothing. All right, so the second one, this is called Imp Impossible Stairway World, um, has, you know, it's taking this idea one step further. How do you do that? Well, you can look at Escher or you can look at Piranesi with the imaginary prisons and their works at base are using the impossible figures. So something like the Penrose Triangle. So the idea is to, you know, do that, but only in a grid system make the image look locally coherent, but confound you on a general level. Um, and if you're wondering about the pigs, that's just because, well, I think pigs are largely unappreciated, misunderstood, mistreated. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing my small contribution to changing their image, making it a little more positive in the world. And then finally, you know, taking it all the way, you can play around with the dimensions and, or sorry, with the axes. And, uh, you know, you've got the X, Y, Z axes here, combined twisting um, where what's going on with the perspective and so on. Um, you can think about this as being a visualization of what it's like to live in a shell maybe, um, or something like that. All right, the next thing is a theme rather than a style that I developed. And, you know, since it's, we're in the domain of art, we can talk about feelings and emotions and, and senses and things like that, and, and maybe not be all too analytical about it. Um, so hidden geometry is about taking something that's already artistic, in this case, the Ivan Ivazovsky painting. Um, you know, what do you feel about it? Or in this case, what did I feel about it? And why did it touch me? And trying to express the motions that I sensed in the painting through geometry and color um, as I felt fit at the time when I was doing it. So this is kind of a poor man's augmented reality. You know, it's just, you've just got an iPad, you haven't got uh, um, the knowledge and the know-how to go anywhere further than just sort of drawing something. So you can take that one step further rather than taking other people's art, you take your own photos, which have already you already have a connection to, you already thought were artistic for whatever reason, and try to augment them further, um, especially in the case of shadows, it's always 
um, interesting to ask yourself, you know, what do you see in these shadows? Different people see different things, especially if you were there, then the connection to the place and the photo you took is um, obviously uh, far stronger and far more impact impactful. And then finally, you can go and make something and then, <laughs> and then express the making of that something by augmenting the photo. Um, so if you've never if you've never done stone piling, I recommend it. Um, it's a good way to safely reacquaint yourself with gravity. So there are there are many unsafe ways to reacquaint yourself with gravity, but this is a safe way to 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 do that. Um, we forget a lot of the time in, in daily life that we get free balance essentially through our muscles and tendons. On the other hand, if we're scientists, then we're kind of focused on the intellectualized si intellectual side of gravity. So then working with something like stones, uh, rigid, hard, dense, um, you're forced to kind of de-intellectualize them because you're working with very um, irregular shapes, but also make them physical, sort of you're balancing with your body, but you're not balancing your body, you're balancing other bodies and you're not allowed to support them. They have to stand on their own. So anyway, the, that process is um, what you see here um, visually expressed. And finally, um, this is the bit that I was talking about, the storytelling and the imagination. So formally, you can say from the outside, I did a project, which was a blog with 80, 80 drawings and so on, um, which was a visual storytelling exploration as seeded by randomly chosen words. OK, um, now I can't actually see the words. Sorry, I'll have to go out, move you guys somewhere else. This is always a problem with Zoom. OK. Fine, so the question is, what was the original motivation? I mean, I, I gave you the, the outside, um, the outside definition. The original motivation was, I kept looking for ways to explore the limits of my own imagination, but in a kind of systematic way. So not just, oh, I'm kind of drawing around, I'm doing stuff and, and it's not really systematic. I'm not really, well, as you know, a mathematician at heart, I, I kind of want to make some patterns emerge, so say something meaningful, not to say come up with a theorem. So to do that, I wanted to make my imagination into a space, so to speak, with certain dimensions or certain variables, knobs, things that I could move, play around with. And this is what came out. So the idea is you see on the right, you know, I've got five words which are coming from a random word generator. And then I take them and try to produce to the best of my ability uh, a story out of them. So here we have lemon, earplug, destruction, elephantine and device. And what you end up with is a steampunk elephantine device with lemons that have earplugs, uh, you know, because it's so noisy and they're going around and destructing lemon squeezes. I mean, you know, <laughs> You're stretching the imagination, but then, you know, that kind of is the point. Um, okay, and then, you know, this, this goes on. So this one was like oak, gourmet, mole, bedridden, and lock. And this was some kind of story where in this world, the oaks were actually moving around, but this was one poor bedridden oak, which was going through an oak initiation. And, you know, the mole had, has to go around and lock all the roots of the of the tree to the ground make it bedridden but at least the oak gets a gourmet meal i mean that's what it is and so finally this is the one i'd like to end with at nine minutes 19 seconds um horseradish trumpet broom misunderstood street so you end up with a horseradish playing the saxophone a trumpet playing a trumpet and uh, a broom playing a trombone and they're standing on a street. Does that make them misunderstood? Well, I don't know, they're called the misunderstood, the band. Um, and I thought it was an appropriate way to end uh, the presentation because I have a feeling that all of us, you know, artists, scientists, but also like every single individual uh, feels misunderstood at times, about as misunderstood as the trumpet playing the trumpet probably. Thank you. Well, indeed, that's a nice, nice way to put it. Um, I think we are all trumpets playing trumpets in some in some sense. So, very beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, again, 
I, I feel terrible to have to cut this short because I mean, this is what really excites me and I, I really want to spend hours speaking about all these uh, beautiful creations. So many interesting ideas floating in the air. So I really encourage you to join the social times between the sessions later on today, especially after the last one. I'll, I'll, I'll be here with time to, you know, uh, propagate and like diverge into all directions. Um, and now we're gonna break for about five minutes and then uh, I'll resume the meeting for the next plenary session. But thank you so much to all the creators that, that uh, contributed. Uh, it was really fascinating to see all your work and uh, appreciate your time and, and your commitment. Thank you very much. The next session is on music, by the way. So any of the artists here, uh, the geometry of music, visualizing it. So uh, I highly recommend this next uh, talk. Yeah. All right. See you soon, everyone.